Well, on October 15th, 2009, uh, mother and father frantically called the police because they said that their six-year-old son had crawled into a homemade hot air balloon resembling a flying saucer, had released the sandbags, and taken flight over Fort Collins, Colorado. They were terrified, their, their six-year-old son, as, as the, the balloon slowly drifted into the air, and immediately the local police force acted. They called in the National Guard, and there were helicopters that began to swarm around this, this flying saucer-shaped hot air balloon. It, the, the world became, the world stood still. The national media tuned into the story they dubbed Balloon Boy as they watched this little boy, aptly named Falcon, rise into the sky above Fort Collins. Things got scary as as the nation tuned in. He rose to over 7,000 feet, traveled for 90 minutes, and when the balloon finally took a rest as it got close to the Denver airport, by the way, they shut down all flights coming to and from Denver airport. When it finally came to a rest just a few miles outside the Denver airport, they were horrified to find that the boy was not in the basket. The, the world, the national media, they assumed the worst that this young boy, maybe he had fallen out on the, the ride, and they began searching between Denver, Colorado, and Fort Collins, and after hours of searching, they finally found him, but he wasn't hiding along the flight path between Fort Collins and Denver, Colorado. He was hiding in his parents' attic. The family became famous for this for a short time. In fact, they had dozens of interviews and media. One night they went on Larry King Live, and Larry King was asking this six-year-old boy, why did you let the balloon go, and why did you climb into the attic and hide? And he looked to his father, and he said, because dad told me if I did it, I'd be on a show. Suddenly, this, this this news report, which had the, the whole country bought into this, this desperate plea, the seemingly genuine plea of this father and mother, turned out to be a hoax. Just an attempt at 15 minutes of fame by the mother and father who had told their six-year-old son, when the balloon gets released, hide in the attic for a few hours. They did gain 15 minutes of fame, to their credit, along with some jail time and a hefty fine. And Probably rightfully so. See, what was thought to be this, this authentic, desperate plea from a father and mother just turned out to be an attempt at selfish gain. And our culture is obsessed with this idea of authenticity, and there are actually many stories like this one. I'm not saying stories of little six-year-old boys named Falcon flying into the air above their houses or performing a hoax in this way, but, but we have stories like this of people making these, these seemingly desperate pleas, passionate calls for action, or, or distressed petitions that we buy into and we get behind and we support only to find, sadly, that they have ulterior motives. Whether it's the CEO who seems genuine about their cause but is just trying to inflate their bank account, The pastor who stands up passionately preaching a message that doesn't align with their lifestyle behind closed doors, or simply a friend who seems to care only to find that they've gossiped behind your back. We are constantly let down by these seemingly authentic pleas by those in positions of power. And the more we're let down by people, the more skeptical and the more cynical we become. And as much as we love the idea of authenticity, doesn't it seem sometimes like authenticity is like an endangered species? Like everybody's looking for it, but very few people ever have the privilege of seeing it in person. This is important for us to understand because as skepticism and cynicism is growing in our culture, not just towards institutions at large, but especially towards the church, we must ask ourselves, what does it look like to be a church of authentic faith? What does it look like to be a church that doesn't just talk the talk, but actually walks the walk. If we want to have an impact on our city, on the place God has called us to serve, then we must be a people of authentic 
faith, who truly live in love like Jesus. And so as we launch into a brand new sermon series today called Pressure Points, we're going to be asking that question week over week. How do you cultivate a real mature faith, like an authentic faith, a faith that isn't just present when times are good, but when times are hard, a a faith that perseveres in the face of adversity, a, a faith that perseveres and is truly transformative to the human heart. My uh, sermon title today is one that I've borrowed from Pastor Rick Warren. It's this, A Faith That Isn't Troubled by Troubles. I want to talk to you today about how you can have a faith that isn't troubled by troubles. And today, we're going to launch into this sermon series where we're studying the book of James. Now, I want to give you a little bit of context before we dive into this book. This is written by James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, He's mentioned a few times throughout the New Testament, and he is the leader of the Jerusalem church in the first century. James uh, came to faith in Christ and in his brother after the resurrection, and we learn of stories where Paul and Peter interact with him, and, and this transformation in James' life, it's done something amazing in him, but it's caused him to have some less than popular public positions things that make him not so popular among the religious elite, at least, within his society. You see, James was a huge proponent of Christians serving the poor, the orphans, and the widows. This was something he was incredibly passionate about, something we read about multiple times in the book of James, and this became problematic for him, both outside the church and inside the church. In fact, this would be one of the main reasons that James was eventually killed. See, outside of the Christian church in Jerusalem, there's a, a, a story written by the first century historian Josephus about how the high priest Ananus and his, uh, his sages in the Sanhedrin were very disconcerted. They were very disturbed that James was so vocal about serving the poor. And he was critical of those who were wealthy, especially the religious elite. And Ananus was the high priest, he was a Sadducee, and he was one of those religious wealthy elite. James made a call for not just Christians, but everybody in the city of Jerusalem to truly embody the values of God, to to reach out to the poor, to take care of the widow and the orphan. And as he did this, as he served by example, There were a few revolts that inadvertently ended up happening and and coming up. Not things that James pushed, but as poor and the community became frustrated with their situation, they protested. And this was a problem for the wealthy who wanted to hang on to their power and to their money. And so they came up with a really simple solution. If, If we can't deal with James and talk him down from serving the poor, maybe we'll just get rid of him. So outside the church... This was a problem. Inside the church, it was a problem as well, because as James created these ministries, as he served the poor and the orphan and the widow, he watched as as these people would come into his church building. Surprise, surprise, you serve people, you meet their needs, and suddenly they're curious about this thing called the gospel that would lead you to give away your stuff and your money and your food and and, and your house to, to serve people. And so they start showing up. Only the religious elite within the Christian church aren't really having it. They, they don't like the way people carry themselves when they walk through the doors of their church. They don't like this growing disparity of rich and poor. And as my professor, Dr. Michael Walters, writes, profession of faith was common, but conscientious obedience to the word was becoming increasingly and alarmingly rare. And he writes, just like today, authenticity of faith in the first century, seemed to be an endangered species. And this is concerning to Paul, so he, or, or to James. So he, he writes a, a letter to the first century church in Jerusalem to address this lack of authenticity and to address this growing disparity between the rich and poor. And he writes this, starting in James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. 
Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let's just pause there. I love the book of James because it's like every sentence I feel like you could preach one sermon on. Like, it's so rich with theology and and action-oriented things that we can walk away with. There's so much in these first two verses alone that I don't want to overlook. First thing I don't want us to miss, first of three. One, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials. James is saying consider it joy when you face these hardships. Let's put a pin in that. We can't just brush past that. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Notice, too, the word whenever. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Not if you face trials of many kinds. Not if by happenstance you struggle a bit. No, it says when. And James, the brother of Jesus, is echoing the words of of his brother who said, in this world you will have trouble. Problems, trials, and temptations, they're, they're not optional. They vary in intensity from person to person, but they're all too real, and they're unavoidable. Man, I wish this wasn't the case. I wish I just had some control over my problems, you know? Like, can you imagine if you could schedule your problems out at least, how much better that would be? Like, yeah, the engine in my car, the transmission is going to go, but maybe I can schedule that for Wednesday after I pick up the kids and get them home and I'm just a quarter mile from home. That would be amazing if I could schedule my problems. Or, you know, I'm getting really sick. Maybe I can, maybe I can schedule it for when I'm supposed to be at this meeting that I don't really want to attend and have the weekend to really enjoy. But sadly, we can't schedule our problems. Problems are unpredictable. They're a reality of life. Whenever you face trials, it's a given. The third thing I want us to know is that word trial in verse 2. It's actually the same word, the same Greek word used in Acts 27.41, and it's used to describe a ship running into a reef and getting lodged there. In other words, as Dr. Michael Walters writes, these are not mere inconveniences that James is talking about. These are real obstacles. These are real hardships. And some of you here today in person, some people watching it online, you know what this is like. You're going through a trial. You're going through a hardship right now. And man, doesn't it feel like sometimes it's not just a bump in the road. It's like a ship being lodged onto a reef where it's just wave after wave comes and hits you and you wonder if you'll ever be able to get out to the other side. And if that's you today, I want you to know something. You came to a church that is not the church of those who have already arrived, who have perfect lives, with no problems, whose kids make perfect decisions. No, we are a church that is on a journey to live in love like Jesus, and we're here to support one another along the way, through the trials, through the hardships. If you came to church today carrying baggage, carrying problems, you came to the right place. Now, one thing I want to be sure to do in this sermon is I don't want to downplay anybody's problems because your problems are real and they're hard, but I do want to say this. God is bigger than your problems, and he promises to never leave us or forsake us. Listen, in this world, you will have trouble, but what James seems to say here, what he's saying is that our response to trouble Our response to hardship actually develops in us an authentic faith. Our our response in the middle of a trial is that very thing that can carry us through to the other side of the storm. James continues, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. We don't want to miss this part either, this idea of being double-minded. Being double-minded is, is, is like when you have divided loyalties and divided affections. It's like that person that says, I really want to get healthy, but 
man, I don't want to give up my Cheetos. Yeah, the keto diet sounds great, but the Cheeto diet sounds even better. Yeah, I really want to have a strong marriage with my spouse, but I'm just not willing to give up that hobby or that time to build a marriage with my spouse. Yeah, I really want to have a deep and meaningful relationship with God. There's just some habits and behaviors that I don't want to get rid of right now. That's what it means to be double-minded, and it seems that James is making this case that if we're double-minded, we cannot cultivate an authentic faith, and we certainly can't persevere through storms. I I think of it like this. It's like driving in a snowstorm here in upstate New York. Just, Just in case anybody's watching online who is not from upstate New York. I know we have Carl who tunes in every week from Arizona. So Carl, you're probably not experiencing snow like this. But uh, an upstate New York snowstorm is, is not just some flakes falling. I'm talking about when it's just a whiteout. You know, when you turn your high beams on and you can't see through that wall of snowflakes. And so you actually have to look through the storm to the road in front of you. And have you ever been in a situation where you're in some random place in the middle of nowhere, like, say, Houghton, New York, for example, and the plows have not gotten there yet, and you're in a snowstorm, and you can't even see the road, you can only see the trees on the side of the road, and you use those as markers to get you from point A or point B? You see, as that snow comes pouring down, if you're looking at the storm wall right in front of you, you're not going to make it home safe. You have to look through the storm to the road up ahead. And this is the picture of what it means to be single-minded. It says, Paul says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. See, being single-minded is looking ahead of the storm, looking through that storm wall to the promises of God. When we're in a storm, when we're in the wilderness, when we're struggling, we remind ourselves of the promises of God. We remind ourselves, as Scripture says, that He will uphold us with His righteous hand. We remember that he will never leave us or forsake us. That when we look to the hills, that's where our help comes from. The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That he will instruct us and teach us the way we should go. It's just like a person who gets lost in the wilderness. And they have to look up to see the north star to guide them as a compass to safety. So we too, in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of trial, we look to the promises of God to lead the way. To guide us through the storm. It's interesting because you'll notice the subtle shift begin to happen in you as you pray. You may still pray, God, save me from this situation, but you also might start praying, God, save me through this situation. God, I I need to be delivered from this situation, but God, I also know you can deliver me. You You can sanctify me. You can make me more like you through this season of hardship. And as we begin to pray those prayers, as we look to God to mature us in our faith, through the hardship, we're able to take joy in trials. And that's a phrase that sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? Because the last time I checked, it's not a whole lot of fun to go through stuff. It's not fun to go through that financial crisis or that health scare How do you take joy in that broken relationship? Is this some kind of some masochism or like, oh, I'm so happy I'm suffering today. What a great day. No, it's not rejoicing in the situation you find yourself in. It's rejoicing in spite of it. It's not minimizing your pain either. It's not saying, well, you know, it's not that bad. we, We don't ignore the fact that we're going through the trial. But we look to God, the maker of heaven and earth, the the God of, of promise to lead us out of the land of exile and into the land that he has called us to. 
We rejoice. We believe that he will never for, leave us or forsake us, that that good work he's doing, he'll see to completion. And that perspective, that, that shift, that having joy in the face of trials, it will begin to develop this authentic, mature faith, this faith that is anchored in the promises of God that can't be blown about like the waves of the sea, but is firm on the foundation of God's Word. James concludes this part of the letter by saying, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms falls and its beauty destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even when they go about their business. In other words, he's saying to these rich people in the congregation, all that stuff you have, all that status, all that wealth, it's all going to fade away. And then he says this, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. If I could maybe sum up James's teaching in these first 12 verses, we could say something like this. Real simple, real easy. No cross, no crown. No cross, no crown. It, it seems to me that what James is communicating is that hardships are not optional to grow authentic faith. They are essential and we will face hardships. The question is, are you going to let those hardships make you bitter or better? Are you going to allow those hardships to mature you and develop an authentic faith that you can carry with you the rest of your life? Are you focusing your eyes ahead through the storm on the promises of God, allowing Him to develop in you character and integrity and love that is only from Christ? Now, I, I've shared before... Um, a little bit of this story, how uh, my mom is uh, at one time was really into weightlifting, and she would uh, do these competitions, and one day she set a women's world record for her age group for deadlifting 265 pounds, which is amazing. It's really impressive. I started uh, lifting weights really seriously when we moved here to Rochester, and I had to beat my mom's record. I could not let her hold that world record. And so immediately, first few weeks, I'm trying to deadlift, lift this weight. I've got 250, 255 pounds on there. And what I found is that I didn't have the correct posture when I was trying to pick up the weight. And so as I would pick up the weight, I would feel all these things tear and do bad things in my back. And sure, I could lift up 200-something pounds, but it really hurt. And it put me out of commission for a number of weeks to where I couldn't do that workout, and I'd have to start all over again and try to beat my mom's record. Three years later, I still haven't beaten it. And, um, you know, th that idea of, of your muscle tearing when you lift weights, it's actually what makes you stronger. It's just when you lift weights... It, you have to tear the muscle correctly. You have to have the right posture when you lift weight in order to tear the muscle in a way where it will grow and form a stronger muscle. When you go through the hardship of lifting up that weight, your posture is what makes or breaks you. Your posture in relation to the weight is that very thing that will either cause you to get stronger or cause you to get weaker. And in the same way, our posture as we go through the hardships of life will either make us stronger in our faith or weaker. You say, what kind of posture do I need to have? Again, it's that posture of looking to the promises of God. It's not downplaying our situation. It's looking ahead to the promises of God. And as you do that, you'll see your faith mature. You'll take joy in trials, in the face of trials. But let's just be honest and say this for what it really is. This is a, a much easier sermon to preach than it is to actually live out, isn't it? Like, it's one thing to say, yeah, keep your eyes focused on God. It's another thing to do that when that diagnosis comes up. It's another thing to do that when life hits you and that thing you didn't see coming hits you all at once. And 
I've been doing this thing as I prepare my sermons week by week. I write about 85% of it on Monday, and then I kind of sit through the week and just ask God, you know, God, will you speak through me to kind of wrap this sermon up? Maybe give me a tangible example or or a life experience to where I can really um, communicate this well and, and give people something to walk home with. And this week, I decided to do that, and then I looked at the text and thought, oh boy, I really hope I don't have a trial this week where I actually have to live this thing out, you know, like I, I don't really want to have to embody this. None of us like the idea of trials, none of us like the idea of hardships, and I, I'm happy to say I didn't have an incredibly intense hardship this week, but something up came, something else came on my radar as I was praying about this message and finishing it. I got a message from Henry's teacher that this Wednesday is Juneteenth. And as Henry gets older, and as Junia gets older, I want to be able to communicate with them well what Juneteenth is. I I want them to be able to understand it, just like I communicate other holidays that we recognize. So I began doing some thinking and reading, and I I came across... uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And I realized I hadn't read that letter yet. I, I'd heard it, I had seen quotes from it, but I hadn't read it. And, and it, it's an amazing letter, well written, and, and has so much gospel truth saturated in it. But the backstory is equally as interesting. See, Dr. Martin Luther King was seeing the disparity and the segregation happening all across the U.S., but especially in Birmingham, Alabama. You see, while certain um, schools had taken away segregation, while certain businesses had desegregated, Birmingham had stood firm in their segregation. Dr. Martin Luther King begged with the governor, begged with the mayor. He tried to negotiate some path in which they could move forward, and finally it came to a point where Dr. Martin Luther King realized that these talks were not going to lead to anything substantial, and so he organized a peaceful protest, a march on Birmingham right around Easter Sunday. And it's amazing, as they walked down the street, many people stood in their Good Friday dress, ready to go to church, and witnessed as this man led this, pe- this peaceful group of protesters in peaceful protest to protest the segregation and the dehumanization in that city. And you know, as you read the, uh, the account of the letter from Birmingham jail, which by the way, Dr. Martin Luther King was thrown in jail for holding a peaceful protest, as, as he's writing this letter, it's amazing to me. He, he's writing in response to this group of eight white evangelical leaders who have issued a statement, and they've said things along the lines of, you know, We understand that this is a problem, but it's not going to be fixed overnight. Yeah, we understand this is an issue, but the timing of this was just not good. This is going to inspire people to do bad things and cause issues in town. And Dr. Martin Luther King wrote in response to this. And what so shook me to the core was the fact that as Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, it wasn't just the overtly racist people in Birmingham that he had a problem with. You know, the the pastors who were inviting members of the KKK to come speak during a service. The people who went to church on Sunday and had whites-only signs in the doors of their stores. He was equally as disappointed with the white church who said that they agreed with the idea of desegregation, but refused to change their way of living. They still went in separate bathrooms still used separate drinking fountains, still went in separate stores, still sent their kids to separate schools. As Dr. Martin Luther King wrote from the Birmingham jail under increasing pressure and inhumane circumstances, I was amazed at his faith in God through it all. You know, as, as he was preparing for this peaceful protest, he had this, this filter in which he let people come down and protest with them. He said this to them. He said, are you able to accept blows without retaliation? 
And are you able to endure the ordeals of jail? And if you weren't, he said, don't protest with us. I've never been in a situation like that. I've never endured hardship like that. But it amazes me the faith and goodwill this man had towards the church, even in the face of such overwhelming opposition. It's amazing the faith that he carried with him, that in that moment he didn't allow himself to get bitter. He allowed it to make himself get better. In fact, after being released from the Birmingham jail, it would be just a few months later that he would march with 250,000 people on Washington, D.C. to protest segregation and give his famous I Have a Dream speech, where he would quote from the prophet Isaiah, filled with hope, saying this, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And after all that he had been through, after all the ways he had been treated poorly, dehumanized, as he'd seen his brothers and sisters segregated and pushed into poverty by the systems of the day, Dr. Martin Luther King leaned into a faith that would go on to inspire thousands of people to not just talk the talk when it came to their faith, but to actually walk the walk. I wish I could give you a really practical take home today, you know, something you could do starting today when you get home. But the truth is, I don't know what you're going to face today. I don't know what you're going to face this week or in the coming weeks. But I do know this, that the testing of our faith can produce in us an authentic faith, a faith that can't be moved, that can't be shaken, a faith that is anchored in the promises of of God and that faith it will not just change you will not it will not just shape you in your heart but it will begin to pour out it will overflow into the lives of people around you as you seek to develop an authentic faith as you weather those storms people will look at you and will say I don't know how that person can still get on their knees and pray when they're dealing with that diagnosis man I, I don't know how they're still picking themselves up and going to church after they went through that relational breakdown. Man, I I don't know how that person can lift their hands and worship and praise to God in the middle of the storm that they're in. But my friends, if you will allow God to, if you will anchor yourself to the promises of God, if you will look to the hills where our help comes from, God can develop in you and I a rich, authentic, meaningful faith that cannot be shaken. At this time, I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. And I'd ask that as we go into this song, that that you know a, a few things. One, that the altar is open for you today. If you're just going through stuff and you just need encouragement, if you just need someone to come lay their hand on you and pray over you, we'd, we'd encourage you to come to the front. And receive that prayer. I also know that the posture you take in worship is is really important. And so for some of you, you may feel as though you need to stand and worship boldly and proclaim God's promises through this song. But for others, you may need to just sit in silent reflection. And so I want to encourage you as we go into this song to take a posture of worship that feels most appropriate for you to commune with God in this song, asking him to develop a mature and authentic faith in you, whatever you may face. God, we admit that we need you desperately. God, we need that firm foundation of your promises. We we need you to guide us, to lead us through the valleys of life. And we're not trying to minimize what we've experienced, God. Some of us have walked in the room today and we've experienced great trial and great, great persecution and, and hardship today. And Lord, we, we need you because we can't make it to the other side without you. Lord, I know that you can 
develop in us a mature faith. I know that you can meet each one of us and that you can make us better for the trials that we go through, that you will help us cultivate this faith and this reliance on you in the middle of the storm, in the middle of crisis. And so I pray for each person here today. I don't know what they're going to face today. I don't know what they're going to face this week or in the coming weeks. But God, I pray that you would meet them exactly where they were they're at and that they would lean on you and trust in you as a source of their hope, as their firm foundation. And Lord, would you grow in us a faith that inspires us to live in love like you, not just on Sunday morning, but each and every day this week. We pray this in your name. Amen. I'd encourage you to take whatever posture feels appropriate for you as we close in this song.